Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to start a new unit today. And our new unit is called Dynamics. And I have in front of me right now uh, my notes one. And I'm doing something a little bit crazy that I think you need to understand what I'm doing because it's going to look kind of weird on the screen. But I am in a Zoom all by myself. And I'm using recording software to record myself in the Zoom so that I can flip between my PowerPoint here and my document camera that has my notes in front of me. So you'll see me switching here and you'll see some zoom controls sometime and uh, so that's what's going on. All right, so our unit here is called Dynamics. You'll notice that on the top of your notes, the first thing that is that we need to fill in is what is Dynamics? So Dynamics is the study of why objects move. So we've been talking about motion graphs, we've been talking about the acceleration equations, we've been talking about projectile motion, but like, why does all that happen? And that is the topic of dynamics. And the why, for the most part, is because of forces. And most forces are invisible, so we don't really see them, so we're gonna have to learn about those too. And we need a definition of a force. And the real truth is we really don't know a lot about forces. So we're just going to kind of make up a simple definition. And we're going to write down that a force is a push or a pull. It's kind of a lame definition, but it'll at least work to get us through this first lesson. All right, the next thing is I just want to give you a quick overview of this topic. Uh, this is the biggest topic, the biggest chapter of our entire school year. So there's lots of different parts, and it's going to take us a long time to work through all of these things. But all of these topics are based on Newton's three laws of motion. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So I'm going to pause here for a second and I'm going to go back to my notes. So in this first video, we're going to be looking at Newton's first law. The second video, we'll look at Newton's second law. And the third video, we'll investigate the third law. But before we get into Newton's first law, I want to give you a little bit of background um, a little bit of history and how this kind of fits in and, um, and give us, I don't know, something to, to connect this to. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of story and a little bit of stories. And uh, so just hang tight and listen. And at some point we'll come back and we'll start filling that in. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here. And I'm going to go back to Aristotle. So Aristotle lived in the BCs. And we have said that he was a really, really smart guy. He was a philosopher and he said a lot of good things, but he did say some things that were not true. So one of the things that Aristotle said that kind of relates to this topic area was that he believed that you needed a force to keep something moving. And like, why would he think that? So think about riding your bike. So when you apply a force on your pedals, okay, in order to pedal, you have to apply a force. So Aristotle says, well, if you stop applying a force on the pedal, your bike's going to stop. So that makes sense why he said that. But we find out that we could actually think about things a different way. And so it wasn't until Galileo came along in the 1600s that we started thinking about things a different way. So this is a picture of a museum and this is like a racetrack. And it's based on, in this museum, it's based on what I'm gonna call Galileo's racetrack theory. But here's the history story that I want you to kind of think about as we discuss the race car story or the racetrack story. So I told you once that Galileo was sentenced to death because he said that the earth went around the sun. So it's true. He was sentenced to death by the Catholic Church because he said that the earth went around the sun. And he had a telescope and he wanted to show people what he saw in his telescope. He felt he had evidence to share with people to show that the earth does indeed go around the sun. But the people in the Catholic Church did not want to look at his evidence. They instead sentenced him to death. But Galileo, uh, was a pretty prominent man and he had some affluent friends and he had some friends who were high up in the Catholic Church 
and his friends were able to save him. And in order to save him from being killed, he had to agree to not ever speak about this again, to not ever say that the earth went around the sun. And so he said, okay, I won't talk about it again. So he didn't. He instead went home and he wrote a play. He wrote a two person play. And one of the characters in the play was like a science guy. And the other character in the play was like a priest kind of representing the Catholic church. And in the play, the words of the play, the science guy was presenting his idea that the earth went around the sun and was presenting the evidence that he saw from his telescope trying to explain to the priest guy what he saw. And of course, the priest guy is getting mad and the science guy is trying to give more evidence. And let's just say the whole thing did not end well. But the people in the Catholic Church saw through his two-person play and got mad because they said he wasn't supposed to talk about it again. And he said he didn't talk about it. He just wrote a play. They instead sentenced him to death again a second time so it was a little bit harder for his friends to save him the second time but they were able to save him um, but this time he was basically i'll say thrown in jail but he was the jail was his own house so they called it house arrest he was put under house arrest so for the final years of his life which i don't remember how many years it was but it was more than one year for the final years of his life, he lived alone in his house. He was not allowed to leave his house. And they took away all of his reading materials. They took away all of his scientific tools, which back in the day in the 1600s probably weren't a lot, uh, but like took away measuring devices. Um, his timing device was a water clock. So the water would go drip, 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 you know, like for one second, two seconds, three seconds. So they took away all his stuff. And so all he had was paper and pencil. And so he spent his time during the days just writing his thoughts on paper, writing his scientific thoughts on paper, writing what he saw in his telescopes on paper. And, uh, and again, he was sentenced to house arrest because he said that the earth went around the sun. I find that story so sad and uh, just gives you an idea of how much some of these ancient scientists have done for us. Supposedly, um, his house that he lived in when he was under house arrest is now like a tourist place that you can visit. And it's on my list one day to go to Italy and to see that house that he was in. So after Galileo died, his friends went into the house and they... I'll say confiscated, they took his manuscripts. They took his writings that he had in all of these little notebooks and they smuggled them out before anybody could get there and they published them. And uh, so in one of his manuscripts is what I'm gonna call the Galileo racetrack theory. And so I wanna explain what Galileo wrote down in his manuscripts and how he used a racetrack to try to explain to people how Aristotle's misconception or how Aristotle's thought was a misconception and was wrong. So let's go back and let's look at what Galileo said. So you know what a Hot Wheels track is. That's what I mean by a race, race track. Okay, so let's say we had a Hot Wheels track and I'm just gonna take the Hot Wheels track and we're gonna kind of like bend it like this. So if we took a marble and put it on the Hot Wheels track, you know what's going to happen. The marble is going to go up and then back 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 and back. back, And it'll stop right there in the middle. So like it's going to try to go as high, but it's not going to quite make it. It's not going to quite make it. Not going to quite make it. And eventually it's going to stop. So, but Galileo said, but what if I could get a Hot Wheels track that didn't have friction on it, a frictionless Hot Wheels track? Then, Galileo said, then the marble on this side would go over and it would go to the same height on this side. 
and then it's going to go back and it would go to the same height on this side and basically it would just keep oscillating back and forth i'll say the word forever if there's no friction okay she's going to keep on going back and forth but then galileo said what if i had two hot wheels tracks so that would kind of like go over a little bit farther Plus that's a pretty bad picture that i just drew and but the marble would start here it's going to go over it's going to go over to here and again we're talking frictionless tracks and then let's take a hundred tracks okay if i had a hundred tracks obviously it's not going to be very steep because there's a hundred of them that's off my paper there and then galileo went so far as to say what if i had an infinite number of hot wheels tracks so this will stand for like an infinite number and it's going to go off my paper and so galileo says you get the marble started and now it's going to keep on going it's going to keep on going keep on going it's frictionless so it's going to keep on going it's going to keep on going forever to infinity and basically as long as i have a frictionless track which means a track with no slowing down force on it something will keep on going forever so this little simple idea that he wrote in his manuscript was really a big big concept once you get something moving it will keep on moving forever so remember though that galileo now has died and the same year galileo died newton was born not the same day but the same year so newton is a one generation away from galileo so galileo comes up with the racetrack theory let's jump ahead to newton now so newton is a young lad okay and so eventually he's 23 years old and he is now a student at trinity university which is in cambridge and coincidentally guess what they were going through a quarantine just like us the bubonic plague which was not a respiratory infection like coronavirus it was a bacterial infection they just didn't know what the bacteria was that was killing people and because they didn't know what it was and they didn't have any remedy for it people were it was a another big big um what's the word pandemic where lots of people were dying so his college shut down and he was sent back to his farm uh, and put in quarantine like everybody else and so 23 years old this is when he did a lot of his work his famous works were when he was in quarantine from the bubonic plague so he read galileo's manuscript about the racetrack theory and he just had it just kind of like got his mind thinking and anyways he came up with his three laws of motion his first law of motion is really galileo's racetrack theory and he gives galileo full credit for the racetrack theory so we are now ready to start your notes and look at newton's first law all right newton's first law says an object at rest will remain at rest kind of common sense and then an object in motion will remain in motion but even more specifically it when it's in motion it will keep on moving in a straight line at a constant velocity so going back to the racetrack theory once i get the marble moving it's going to keep on going in a straight line at a constant velocity looking for the end of the racetrack but the end of the racetrack is infinity away so it's going to keep on going unless acted on by a net force in a net force in our examples of the bike and of the racetracks would be friction friction is a like a slowing down force and if friction is present then it the marble or the bike will eventually stop all right the next thing is that newton's first law is sometimes called the law of inertia so inertia is a physics vocab word inertia means resistance to change motion if something has a lot of inertia it means it's hard to change its motion so for example uh, i have a picture here of an elephant 
and a little mouse guy. Right here's my mouse guy. And inertia is proportional to mass, meaning the more mass you have, the more inertia you have. So what I mean by that is I want you to picture the elephant and the mouse running across the room. It's like this little mouse guy, he's scurrying all over the place. He can like change direction. He's zigzagging all over because he's so tiny. He does not have a lot of inertia, he does not have a lot of mass. He does not have a lot of inertia. So it's easy for him to move. But the elephant who's more massive has a lot of mass, has a lot of inertia, and he has a lot of resistance to change motion. I want to jump down to, uh, on your notes here, the first question says, how do you outrun something bigger and faster than you? Let's pretend a bear is chasing you. How could you outrun the bigger, faster bear? You're tinier than the bear. So you could be like the mouse. You're going to zigzag all over the place. And because the bear is bigger and clumsier, he's going to have a hard time keeping up with you because he has a lot of inertia. He has a lot of resistance to change his motion. So zigzag running is a good idea for you. So I'm going to write that I'm going to run in a zigzag path. Zigzag path. All right, as we continue down here, um, I'm going to be talking through some examples here just to give you some different thoughts to help you picture what Newton's first law is. And as I talk about them, you can just jot a couple notes down here, um, but it doesn't have to be perfect, okay? All right, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. So some things that we're going to talk about. So examples of Newton's first law. The second one, books on the back seat of a car. So has this ever happened to you that you put your books or your purse or a box on the back seat of the car and you're driving down the road and all of a sudden you have to slam on your brakes? What happens to the books on the back seat of the car? Everyone knows that those books go flying forward, okay? So the question is, why do the books, remember this whole unit is about the why, why do the books go flying forward? We could say, an object in motion remains in motion. Your car was going 60 miles an hour. That means those books were going 60 miles an hour. You stopped your car. Those books continued to go 60 miles an hour forward until they hit a net force, which would have been the back seat, and then fell to the floor. Anytime you slam on your brakes, the stuff in the trunk slides forward. Okay, it keeps an object in motion, remains in motion. All right, the next one is a spaceship. So number three says, what happens to a rocket once it's launched? Do you know what the hard part about launching a rocket is? Launching it. Launching it. Like, I don't know how to launch a rocket, okay? But luckily, the people at NASA figured out how to do that. So once you launch a rocket, what do you do? You launch it, and that rocket keeps on going in a straight line forever. You don't have to do anything. You don't need to put more gas in it. You don't need to do anything. You want to take pictures of Saturn, point it to Saturn, and eventually that rocket's going to get to Saturn. It's going to launch. It's eventually going to reach that constant speed, and it's just going to keep on going at a constant velocity forever. And so we have things out in space. It's called space junk. We've dropped things. We've dropped a screw. We've dropped a hammer. And you know what? They're still flying through space in a straight line forever. Now there's a new rule that anytime you have something out in space, like if you want to take a hammer or a screw, whatever, you have to have it like tethered to your spacesuit so that if you drop it, it won't continue traveling forever. It like will stay connected to you. Pedaling a bike. So I pedal my bike, my bike, I only have to pedal one time. I pedal and my bike will continue going in a straight line, constant velocity in a straight line forever. Oh, but that doesn't work because when I pedal my bike, there is a net force present. And if there's a net force, then I'm going to get, I'm going to stop. And the net force in my bike would be friction. Pulling the tablecloth out from under China. 
So one year I was teaching at High School North, and the other physics teacher there, I think he's gone now, his name was Mr. Harm, um, he, he demanded that every student did the tablecloth trick. Okay, so the tablecloth trick is that you put a dinner plate and a cup and a saucer and I don't just some heavy stuff on a tablecloth and you have to pull the tablecloth out without breaking the china. But you know what? It's classic. It's Newton's first law. An object at rest will remain at rest. The china's at rest. You're not pulling the china. You're only pulling the tablecloth. And I was so nervous doing it myself. But the key to it is you have to pull the tablecloth like totally in the X direction, like totally in the, if you have any arcing up or arcing down, then it kind of um, will start to, well, it will slide and the stuff can fall off and break. But pulling the tablecloth, why does that happen? An object at rest will remain at rest. And then my last questions are about dropping the package from the plane or shooting yourself in the head from the back of the pickup truck. Why does that happen? Because the package was in motion and it remains in motion. The package was going 500 miles an hour from the airplane when I let go. The package was still going 500 miles an hour. The bow and arrow or the gun from the back of the pickup truck. If the pickup truck was going 60 miles an hour, when you fire the gun, it continues to go 60 miles an hour, and then that bullet will hit you right in the head. So all examples of Newton's first law. All right, I think that's a long enough intro for the first law, and I'll meet you back in the second video to talk about Newton's second law.